So welcome everyone. If you have an INAT username, feel free to add that in there. If you don't have one yet, uh, no worries. You're going to learn all about iNaturalist and how to sign up. See some familiar names. Give it another minute or so. If you're just joining us, be sure to put your name in the chat with your organization, if that's relevant, um, as well as your iNaturalist username if you have an account already. And if you don't, no problem. And then just uh, housekeeping, if you can make sure we're on mute um, so we, everybody can hear. Great, uh, Laura, do you think we can get started? And if, uh, let's see, hit record, if you have that option, or if it's already recording. Yeah, already recording. Great, perfect. All right, so. Thanks everybody for joining us for this Chicago Wilderness Cafe. This is just one in a series of uh, presentations that Chicago Wilderness puts on uh, throughout the year. And if you're not familiar with Chicago Wilderness, I encourage you to check them out at chicagowilderness.org. So if you're just joining us, please do go ahead and put your name and organization. If you have an iNaturalist username, put that in the chat. And so we can all see if we recognize each other's usernames or if you don't have one yet, uh, no worries. I wanted to start off with a poll and if you can, should be popping up on your screen. You guys are fast. 55% voted, 75%. Let's give it a couple more seconds. And All right, so you guys can see the poll results. We've got a moderate level of familiarity with iNaturalist, but most people attending have not participated in the City Nature Challenge. So perfect. Um, I will stop sharing those results and go ahead. All right, so my name is Cassie Sari. I am Budalua on iNaturalist. That's my username. In case you have ever seen anybody identifying plants in the Chicago region, you might recognize my name. I'm on there all the time. I really like helping out with plant identification. I am a botanist and ecological restoration practitioner. Um, I work in prairies and wetlands and woodland savannas in the Chicago uh, area. And specifically, I work for the Chicago Park District with our natural areas program. So my background is in doing a lot of mapping, working in GIS, coordinating research projects, and doing natural areas planning as well. On iNaturalist, I am a curator, which is a volunteer position. I like helping out new users and kind of keeping the, the database of names up to date um, and help troubleshooting issues that come up. And then also, I am the president of the Northeast chapter of the Illinois Native Plant Society, which is a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to the conservation and appreciation of our local native plants and natural ecosystems. This is a picture of the trunk of my car. Uh, this is a big, our, our plant Bible for the Chicago region, really useful resource and uh, always out and looking at the native plants and animals that uh, live in our area. So iNaturalist is, most people think of it as an app. You know, it's both on iOS for Apple devices and it's also on Android. Despite that kind of circa 2007 name, uh, it is available on Android as well. 
it is also a website. A lot of people don't realize that it's a website. And personally, I use the website way more than I use the apps. So it has a lot more features. iNaturalist also has this cool kind of computer vision feature where you can just show iNaturalist a picture of something and it'll take its best guess as to what that species is just looking at the photo. It's kind of like the future, <laughs> really cool resource. But it's also a huge community of people who like to share their knowledge about how to identify different species. And you have those people sharing their observations. And so it kind of has this balance between being a place to share your nature observations, but also has like a scientific uh, aspect to it as far as it being a huge database of where different plants and animals occur. So although iNaturalist isn't specifically a science project, a lot of organizations use it as a platform for science projects. And you get this huge, awesome map and database of all of our biodiversity throughout the world. So really, when it comes down to it, it's like an app and a website for nature nerds, whether you are totally new to learning about nature and you have no idea what something is, or you're the world's most expert uh, taxonomist in turtles. You know, everybody comes with different level of uh, knowledge and sharing on a naturalist, no expertise required. So it started in 2008. I really like its origin story. Kenichi, he wanted something like this to exist. So he went to school to learn how to build it. And he's still working on the project today. And now it has the backing of organizations like the California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic. And it's also completely free and open source and it's actively developed. So you don't have to worry about it going away um, and you don't have to worry about ads or paying for a certain amount of data or anything like that. So I pulled these stats relatively recently. There are over 65 million observations of plants and animals on iNaturalist all throughout the world, which uh, with over 300,000 species as well. So you can see there's kind of hot spots. It did start in Southern California or in California um, and throughout North America, there's quite a bit of activity. Southern Africa also has quite a few users and there's a very strong community in New Zealand as well but it's growing and growing throughout so wherever people are. So we kind of tired of seeing these exponential charts, but this is a good one. Uh, this is a, a chart of the number of observations per year throughout uh, since it uh, began and just keeps going up and almost doubling every single year the past few years. So as far as comparing iNaturalist to kind of traditional ways that people collect data about plants and animals. This is a picture of an herbarium specimen, or you might recognize this as common milkweed that is very abundant throughout Eastern North America. This graph is showing how many of these pressed collections that scientists made uh, starting in 1822. So about five or 25 to 40 specimens per year with a total of uh, around 4,000 specimens that were uh, digitized and put into the GBIF database. If you compare that to what people are adding to iNaturalist since 2007, there are, just in 2020 alone, there were over 15,000 documentations of this species growing in Eastern North America with a total of 40,000 observations. So that's just a, it's a whole order of magnitude more of data. And of course, it, these are just pictures that people are sharing. So we're not getting you know, DNA, we're not getting a lot of the information that is really vital and necessary for these herbarium specimens uh, to continue to be collected. But we can use that information to understand different things about it because of the scale of that amount of data that's being collected. So why do I use iNaturalist? Um, I've used it since uh, 2012. And I first used it because I saw a grass and I was at work and I needed to know what a grass was and I couldn't figure it out. You know, I looked through the key, the field guide and tried to figure it out myself. And I just, you know, I just kept hitting a roadblocks and wasn't able to figure it out. So I looked for something that could help me with the identification and I, stumbled upon iNaturalist. I also use it as kind of a nature journal. These are, this is a map of my observations. So if I, one time I went to Alaska and I you know, recorded a moose that I saw and kind of have it as like a little record of my trip for Alaska. I went to Italy um, and found some cool wildflowers and didn't know what they were. And so I used the iNaturalist to help me uh, figure out what they were and kind of record it as a little bit of like a memento for my trip. I use it to learn about species. There's all sorts of different information you can find on there. Um, and then in turn, I like to help other people with that identification process. It's really great while you're traveling. I've used it to kind of look for biodiversity hotspots and see where other people like to go. That might be a good place to go hiking or find cool species. And then I really like the opportunity it provides to 
use it as a uh, for like volunteering and contribute to this global database and participate in different types of community or citizen science projects. And then also at the Chicago Park District, I've used it to see what people are finding in our parks. So for example, I saw a uh, some skinks, some lizards that were living in one of our parks and just, I had no idea they were there. So just that somebody had put them on iNaturalist uh, gave me the opportunity to see all this data that I, you know, I have limited time. I can't get out to all the parks all the time. And there's so many people out there looking at nature. So one thing I teach plant identification classes as well. And you may have seen this floating around on social media. Um, how many people can you know name these brands on the left, but really then compared to how many people can actually name these species on the right. And really, you know, it should be the other way around. We should be able to identify the plants and trees and animals that we see on a daily basis. So you may have seen this called like plant blindness, but uh, a good term for it is also plant literacy, learning and understanding and knowing the, the plants and animals. So iNaturalist is really just one part in a lot of different ways to learn about nature. So there's books and field guides. Somebody, you might have somebody really knowledgeable who points it out and shows you species. You might write down notes, um, use Google and sort of search for plants to based on how many petals they have or what color the flowers are. And these are all really great resources uh, to learn about species. But my naturalist is just kind of another tool in your toolbox to uh, work towards learning about nature. So I really like that there is a, a huge community of people who are eager to help with this identification. But at the same time, you have that computer vision feature where it just looks at the photo and tries to identify it. You can record your notes for identification. So if somebody told you, oh, well, it has you know, so this so many petals and it's white and the leaves are very dissected, you can kind of record that and use the, the text note description as a way to kind of uh, remember what things are. And then as well, using that nature journal and kind of building different pathways towards, okay, I saw this species at this park when I was with my friend, such and such. And that kind of helps uh, with that memorization process as well. And then there's this huge database of other people who are observing species. So in a field guide, you might get the picture of the flower. That's like a typical thing that you would see in a book. But on iNaturalist, you can see what it looked like, you know, in, the, in April versus what it looked like in August. So you have this huge database of um, all stages of life, whether it's um, a plant or an animal or um, whatever type of creature. So on iNaturalist, you have observations. And observation is kind of like the basic unit of iNaturalist. You'll hear me say observation quite a lot. So in this example, you see eight observations. An observation is defined as somebody's encounter with an individual organism, organism at a particular time and location. So what I mean by that is we could both go out and both see this, um, this uh, pawpaw flower, which is super cool and awesome color. And we could both make observations because it's recording our encounter. So it's no problem having two people observing the same thing. That's fine. And researchers take that into account when they, when they look into the database. So you can have photos, you can have sounds, and then you can even use the same photo and make two observations. So I would make one observation for the flower and one observation for the fly. So to make those observations, you go out, you explore, you take photos, you record sound, or you just say, you know, I saw this bird at this location. You put them in the app, or you can use the website to share that information with everybody else on iNaturalist. And then there's this identification period and discussion period. So that might look like you go look for, you can do it in your backyard, in front of your house. You can look for local forest preserves or parks, record what you see. Um, again, you can use it on Android or Apple, or you can, if you have a fancy camera, you can use that and then use the website and then share those observations. Um, this is what the app looks like. This is the, it's a pretty easy standard photo process where you just search for the photos on your computer and share them or just drag and drop them in. Um, and then there's this identification period. So you, when you're adding observations, you there's 0% requirement to know what you're looking at. That's totally fine if you just want to say, I know it's a plant. That's totally normal. Um, and you can say, I know it's a bird. I have no idea what kind of bird. Somebody help me identify this bird. And then you can also use that computer vision or automated image recognition feature that iNaturalist has. 
And there's this huge community of people who are going through the existing observations and looking for help to identify and not even just identify things that are unknown, but also to help confirm things that are known to give a little bit of verification process. Like you say, it's a blood route. I agree, it's a blood route. That gives that a little bit more vetting, um, a little bit more confidence that that identification is correct. So this is a GIF of that computer vision process on three different observations. So I'm literally just tapping or clicking where it says species name and the computer is looking at those pictures and comparing it to the huge database of, of observations and saying, we think it looks like these species in some cases. So say this picture in the middle, it's a picture of a flower with a bee on it. It will often focus on the animal. Um, so there, there is a new feature I think coming out at least on uh, Android where you'll be able to say, no, 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 I would just want to identify the flower and you can kind of narrow that down. But this will give you a, a really good, um, it's, it's quite confident in most cases, uh, especially in North America for plants. Uh, it's very good, <laughs> surprisingly good. And so these are, this one on the right particularly, it's a scirpus, which is a, a grass-like plant that most people overlook and don't know, but it, it because there's this database of scirpus species identified to species, um, it is able to guess correctly that it is Scirpus cyperitis. So it'll tell you the genus, which is kind of a general group of what it could be, and then it'll give you some species suggestions. So you don't have to collect, select one of those. You can if you want. You could also just say, you know, I don't trust the computer vision in this case. I'm just going to say I know it's a plant, and that's, that's fine too. So you can either type in what you want, or you can use that computer vision suggestion. So when you're doing identifications, you want to identify to the finest level you're confident. In this example, I had no idea what it was. I was pretty sure it was something like a butterfly or a moth larva, some sort of caterpillar. So I just said Lepidoptera, and that's you know a large, very large group of butterflies and moths. And then quite soon after, somebody else came along and he added his identification and said that it was some sort of owlet moth. And uh, and that was great, like cool owlet moth. And then somebody else came along quite quickly, and she, Kate the Great, she identified it as a particular tribe of owlet moths called Arctiini. And, um, and then it took a, a few months later until somebody else got it down, John Balavan got it down to a particular genus of moths, the Appendesis. So sometimes it's right away, especially for things like birds and um, certain mammals, people will identify them sometimes in minutes. You're like, whoa, wow. <laughs> um, in other cases, it can take a little bit longer, kind of obscure species or things that are a little bit harder to identify. And then you can add identifications and you can also add information about uh, how you came to that identification. And people are often very eager to share their knowledge. It's so, it's such so rewarding to see. So in this case, I knew that Daniel was uh, very knowledgeable about this group of plants called Persicaria or, or water peppers or smart weeds. And so I asked him because it wasn't flowering and I was having difficulty identifying it. I was like, hey, do you have any tips for, um, you know, identifying these non-flowering ones? It's hard to identify them when they only have leaves because some of the keys will look at the flowers or the, 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 the parts of the flowers. And so he says, hi, Cassie, I'm glad you were interested in Persicaria. They are some of my favorite plants, probably because they vex botanists so much. Ha ha, me included. <laughs> and then he, he took the time out of his day to go in there and add in like multiple paragraphs about how to distinguish the common species that are found in our area. And I just thought that was so nice. He's a botanist uh, in New York and took his time to, to share his knowledge with me. Some other cool features on iNaturalist is these life lists. If you remember back to biology, there's a big taxonomic tree of species of plants, animals, fungi, mammals, birds. And so you can, it'll record all the different species that you see uh, within those groups. And you can kind of narrow down, okay, well, what are the species I've seen just in Illinois? Um, or what are the species I've seen just in, in Italy? Or what are the birds that I've seen in Italy? So it's, it's a kind of a new feature to go play around with. Um, this one is just available on the website. Hot off the press uh, and the iNaturalist blog is that 50% of all known vertebrates have now been observed on iNaturalist and added to iNaturalist. For certain groups like birds, 92% of bird species have been added to iNaturalist. And the rest of these are probably species that are extremely rare. Some of them may be extinct. Some of them are maybe known from only a few populations. Um, and then fishes, there's only 42% because they're much more difficult to get photos of and fewer people are looking at them as well. 
So that, as far as uh, research or information that people have been able to get from iNaturalist, there's these species occurrences, where things are living, um, where, where their range may be changing over time as well. So this is an example of a species that was found and published uh, the first time it was seen in the temperate Eastern Pacific. Uh, and somebody published a paper about it, about this species that they found on iNaturalist. Other species have been described for the first time after being seen on, on iNaturalist or their photos added to iNaturalist soon after being described. As far as restoration or conservation or land management invasive species, people have been using it to keep track of new populations of invasive species. This is a, a species of insect that is economically detrimental to certain ornamental trees and shrubs. And so it was found native to Asia and it was found in uh, Southeast Pennsylvania. And I'm not sure exactly which year it was first found, but over time you can see it's been expanding its range, unfortunately. And so there, I think there was one in Michigan that people observed. And one of the things you want to do is if you see egg cases is remove the egg cases um, and try to slow stop and slow the spread of the species. So one cool thing about iNaturalist is that you can, for insects specifically, you can sort those photos by uh, egg versus nymph or, or larva in certain cases, um, and then adult. So I was curious, like, okay, I've been told that I'm supposed to like stomp out these egg cases if I see them, like, what do they look like? So you can go and search for the species on the, the taxon page they got or the species page, and you can sort by photos that just show the eggs. And surprisingly, when I was looking at them, they look very different, like when they're freshly laid versus when they're, the adult has kind of finally completed laying them. So. Um, quite a cool resource. And then the nymphs, they look totally different at different stages of life. So a uh, useful resource for looking at how things change throughout their life cycle. And then I just got a, saw a tweet this morning that I wanted to include. This is a, some researchers in Southern California that look at these lizards that they're very difficult to study. Um, they're often found on private lands. And so having access to observations people are sharing on iNaturalist is super helpful for their uh, natural history research. And they found that in urban areas in Southern California, these lizards are losing their tails at higher rates, um, but the rate of parasitism on the lizards are slower. And so they think that outdoor pets, many of which have been treated for, for parasites like anti-tick treatments, that might be driving you know, both scaring or trying to eat these lizards and they drop their tails, but also that the, the ticks on them, others, they're finding fewer uh, parasites. So they, they had over 1,700 observations from over 400 people for this study, and it, they just wouldn't have had, ac had access to this type of data. They would have been very difficult to collect this data without something like iNaturalist. And then other issue, other uh, research, they've been looking at some dragonflies that have different colored wings depending on the temperature. And they found that in, when they're really hot, the darker winged dragonflies overheated and flew poorly compared to ones that had mostly clear wings. So some implications for climate change uh, as far as the natural history of these dragonflies. So if you're a researcher or a land manager, or just want to be able to look at the data in different ways, you can download it from iNaturalist. You can get it through the API if you know how to do that. Um, and there's also uh, certain data gets sent to GBIF, which is a big huge database that collects data from all sorts of uh, projects, whether they're iNaturalist, eBird, different herbaria. So you can, when you make an observation, you can add photos, you can add multiple photos, and you would always want to make sure that each, each observation just had, you're focusing on one individual organism. You wouldn't want to put a photo of the caterpillar, but also like a separate photo of like a tree you saw later down the road. You just want each observation to focus on one species and one organism. You can also add sounds. So this was a, a cicada that was calling outside of my window that I recorded. And there aren't, you can't do video yet, unfortunately. Um, with more resources, they may be able to add that in the future, but they're a pretty small team at this point. And then if you can just make observations that don't have a photo attached at all. Um, so I knew this, knew I saw, I saw a Canada J, which is a type of bird, but I wasn't able to get a photo of it because it was flying too quickly. Uh, so I just recorded that I saw the Canada J and then I had the location and that was uh, totally fine as well. And then you don't have to have a picture or sound of the organism itself. You can do signs of organisms like beaver chew. You can take a picture of the tracks or the scat or a picture of the nest or the burrows. That, that's all acceptable as well. Sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult to identify it based on the species, but it's quite easy to identify something like a beaver from that. 
And when you're, when you're taking photos for a naturalist, it's a lot of times you're taking photos of relatively small things and it can be kind of a learning process to get your camera to focus on the small things. So a really good tip is to use your hands. They don't have to be National Geographic quality photos to go on a naturalist. Most of my photos have my hands in them and that's totally fine. It helps your camera focus on the, the thing that's um, really close to the lens. If you can use this, uh, some sort of scale uh, don't use your credit card. <laughs> don't use your driver's license. I see that every once in a while. Um, people are just not thinking, but um, you know, use uh, some people carry around a little ruler um, or some other kind of sense of scale, certain coins. And then some people do have really fancy cameras to be able to take high quality photos and those are definitely appreciated. So you can, again, you can use the computer to add your observations. It's just a drag and drop process. And then you'll be able to select the location. Um, the date and the time is usually added automatically based on the timestamps in your photo. And the same thing from the app, you would take the photo, it automatically adds that um, the time and date, and then it also grabs your location um, automatically as well. I would recommend take, like once you take the photo, wait a few moments while the GPS can get a good fix on your location. Uh, it can take a, you know, I usually wait, three, four or five seconds, you can see that the accuracy of that precision will kind of hone in as the satellites kind of figure out where you are. And then I do recommend turning off auto, auto upload in your settings, especially if you have limited data or if you're in an area that has kind of a poor connection that will really help to just kind of keep them in the queue for uploading until you get back to your house and back to good Wi-Fi and you can upload them then. And you can add multiple photos of the same organism to the same observation. So like a photo of the flowers, a photo of the leaves, um, but you do always wanna add, if I took a picture of one flower and then I took a picture of a toad, I'd wanna make that a new observation for the toad. And then you can upload captive and cultivated things. Those are like a, something you planted or like a street tree, uh, but you would always wanna make sure that you check this box saying that it's captive or cultivated. So it's really captive, cultivated or planted. Um, some people upload a picture of their dog. That's fine. It's a test. Just make sure that you check that box so that it's distinguished from like a feral dog. So again, I use the app just pretty much to make observations. And sometimes I look at it to make to look at observations that are near me while I'm traveling. But I use the website to do pretty much everything else. Uploading observations when I'm using a different camera. I use it for making identifications. I don't use the app to, to make identifications. Uh, it's just not really set up for that. It's really kind of streamlined for adding observations. I've used the uh, website for uh, commenting on or faving other people's observations. They took really cool photos. If you wanna create a project, I use the website for that. Writing journal posts, um, viewing that extra information about species, that's all. Some of that is built into the app, but uh, personally, I find the website a lot more, uh, a lot easier to use for that. So if you have kids and you're thinking about using iNaturalist, uh, kids, they do need to be 13 or older to use iNaturalist. There is kind of a verification process that you can do through the Seek app if you have younger children and want to create an iNaturalist account. But uh, kind of in, a lot of people want to do this with their kids, right? And they want to have something for their kids to use that computer vision feature. So they actually did create this separate app called Seek. It's very cool. There's like badges. It's this one is really like the future because you just point your camera at it and it identifies it on the screen like while the camera is open, which is not available currently in iNaturalist. So definitely download this one and check it out. It is kids safe, which means that it's not sharing the, your location live um, like you do if you're making observations. Um, but that also means that you're not contributing to the global database of biodiversity information because of it. So it's, you know, pluses and minuses. Another thing a lot of people do is, you know, create an account for yourself and then have your kids, you know, just use it with you and um, use the geo privacy features, which I don't have enough time to talk about, but there's, there are some options built into iNaturalist to help protect your location, especially if you're making observations near your house. If you're an educator, just a few tips, make sure you use iNaturalist first go for a walk and make 30 observations that'll really give you a good idea of how the process works and kind of see how the identification system works. Have your students work focus on wild organisms and you usually have to build that into the, the curriculum and explaining even what is wild versus not wild can be a whole topic of a conversation. Um, one problem I see every once in a while is that teachers will set large requirements like 200 observations or require them to reach a certain status and that can cause some issues 
um, when people are creating observations. And then, of course, like watch out for kids gaming the system, leaving their homework up to the last day and looking for pictures of plants and animals online. You see that every once in a while, unfortunately. Thankfully, there is a really great teacher's guide that is a really um, nice resource uh, if you're thinking about incorporating iNaturalist into your curriculum. A lot of people ask, like, well, okay, now what? Like, what should I observe? And really, like, observe what looks interesting to you. Just get out and look for anything that's living or evidence of plants or animals. But uh, you'll often find that your local land management agency or local nonprofits, they might have certain community science projects that they're using our naturalists with. So for example, in the Chicago region, we have the Singing Insects Monitoring Program where people go out and record cicadas, katydids, grasshoppers, and they can share them on a naturalist to help us understand the biodiversity of those insects in our area. And every once in a while, I'll get a message from a researcher saying, hey, I saw you observed this species of rust growing on a buckthorn leaf. It's like, I did? <laughs> what? And they're like, oh, can you go collect those? We're, we're studying that particular species uh, interaction. Um, and I had permission to collect at that location and collected some leaves for them and mailed them to this lab in Minnesota. And um, they'll be able to use that for their research. I thought that was so cool. So every once in a while, people might say like, hey, you found something interesting. Can you, you know, look into that a little bit more for us? Because they're in Minnesota, I'm in Illinois, so they, they just can't be everywhere. And having this whole army of people looking out uh, for their project is a useful resource. If you do have expertise, I would encourage you to go on there and help with the identification process. I have a bookmark saved where I look at plants that are flowering plants that are growing in our Chicago parks, um, kind of my go-to search setting. And so there's this whole identify page that makes this process really, really simple and streamlined and fast. And you'll, you'll click on one of these pictures and it will pop up with a little modal that has the pictures bigger. You can add in the identification, whether you know the scientific name or the common name. You can say how you came to that identification, you know, the leaf shape or the, the type of hairiness or the size of the species, and then save that. And that helps that person uh, learn what, what they're looking at. As far as getting more help, there's a lot of different ways. They have a great fact page that has a ton of questions and answers. There are video tutorials, quick ones, like 30 seconds to three minutes or so that tell you how to use that upload page, how to use the identify page. There's a forum of people who are happy to help as well, both staff and volunteers who'd like to help answer people's questions. And there's also like a general support email that they're quite responsive to. So wrapping my part up, uh, just some basic tips. It's not just an app. A lot of people think it's just an app, but it's definitely a website. And most of those features that, that I talked about, you're gonna find on the website or they're, they're on the website and they're just um, a lot easier to use and access than the app. If you're making observations, the app is great, but if you wanna add IDs or learn about species, the website is really a better tool for that. Observe what's interesting to you. You'll kind of learn over time, like what you tend to gravitate towards. A lot of people are just into birds, but then they get into dragonflies and butterflies. Um, so people are just into plants or they just stay interested into plants like me. <laughs> uh, and then don't be afraid to ask for help, whether that's using the platform or getting help with identification. The community of people on a natural search is very happy to assist whether um, it's like, I can't get this uploaded right, or I'm having trouble figuring out if it's a persicaria or a polygonum. Uh, just a very, lots of different people with lots of different expertise. And then don't be afraid at all to make mistakes when you're doing identification. I've been studying plants for a while now and I make mistakes all the time. Um, even like the world's most expert botanist of Chicago region plants may know nothing about the butterflies or the cockroaches or whatever. Everybody's a, a novice in something. So it's kind of expected that, you know, people won't, won't know everything and that we're all kind of learning and sharing our knowledge together. So that's the end of mine. And we'll uh, send it over to Edward to talk about the City Nature Challenge specifically. All right. Thank you, Cassie. Um, Cassie is like our I naturalist queen, let's be real here. Uh, if you've got any questions about how to use that or you know issues, she's like a go-to person. At least I know I have benefited immensely from Cassie IDing all of my observations um, that I've made over the years. Um, so hi guys, uh, my name is Edward. I uh, am one of the other co-organizers for this year's effort with the Chicago region. And I'm gonna talk to you guys a little bit about 
um, the City Nature Challenge, how you can take what everything you just learned here with Cassie, actually put it to use here and uh, you know, a whole bunch of other different sort of uh, benefits of this whole thing. But uh, you can find my name's E. Warden. I don't have a cool scientific name for my tag, but if you wanna find me on Nine Naturalist, that's where I'm at. Uh, I currently am the Conservation Stewardship Coordinator at Shedd Aquarium um, and also serve as president of Chicago Ornithological Society, Reed Bird Nerd. Um, and my main background is in sort of nature education and communications and kind of a whole spectrum of other things in between there, but that's the nice general version of it. Um, and yes, please do talk to me about birds and or mosses because uh, man, mosses on iNaturalist, very underrepresented. And it's really hard sometimes to do ideally because you just take a picture and it's like this mat of green. It's like, well, I, I can't do anything with that. So let's work on those moss ideas. But that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about the City Nature Challenge. Um, what is it? What the heck is this thing? Uh, well, the new, nice thing is, is that it's relatively new. Uh, so if you're in the dark or don't know what it's about, don't uh, feel left out or something like that. But all it is is that it's a friendly competition between urban areas, cities loosely defined across the world to document their urban biodiversity. Um, caveat to that being uh, in COVID times, we've uh, kind of downplayed the competition aspect because of you know trying to avoid pressure uh, for people gathering or trying to go beyond their means and trying making sure that everybody's just staying safe. So while that is kind of sort of the foundation of the City Nature Challenge, I mean, hence challenge, um, we do want to also emphasize that especially certainly last year was the case and this year uh, likely again, uh, the competition aspect is not going to necessarily be the driving factor behind it, uh, but we can still get a lot more, a lot out of this um, out of the City Nature Challenge. So just a little quick blurb in history. It started in 2016, so not that long ago. And it was initially just this, you know, cross state competition between San Francisco and, and, and LA, um, where uh, the California Academy of Sciences and iNaturalist were founded. But it was so successful and popular that it immediately all kinds of other areas were clamoring. So in 2017, it went national. Several cities uh, participated, Chicago being one of the first ones to jump on that bandwagon. Um, and then continue to grow. And as you saw with some of those charts earlier that Cassie was showing, I mean, the use and interest in iNaturalist as a platform has been exponential. Um, and so the City Nature Challenge is both sort of a reaction to that, but then also it, in turn a kind of driver to that. And you can kind of see that in this chart here. Um, when you look at the raw number of iNaturalist observations that are coming in over the years, a big part of driving those forward every year now has been the City Nature Challenge, which really is kind of like a basically just sort of a hyper-focusing weekend, magnifying all of these nat iNaturalist users and magnifying all of those at interest in a nice sort of tight time period here. Um, so going into this uh, new year, so in 2020, uh, about 200, just shy of 250 cities took part across the world. I mean, truly a, a global competition here. Um, and going into the new year here, we're expecting to easily break 300. Uh, so it's again, it's just it continues to grow and continues to build interest because this is just such an easy to use platform uh, and is accessible to just about everybody. All right, and yeah, so here in the Chicago area, these are kind of a rundown of the numbers we had last year. This is pretty in line with how we've generally done most years. This gives you kind of an idea of how our Chicago effort goes. And you know, every year it's been organized generally by a couple of different people. So like Cassie and myself been involved most years, but you know, maybe we weren't necessarily always organizers. It, you know, it's always been a very sort of community led grassroots effort. And that all comes down to the individuals either organizing it, the partner organizations that throw in that year and just kind of, you know, where we're at, you know, in COVID year, it was different. And under the circumstances, it's different. Maybe even it's just weather that drives how it goes. Um, but then that kind of begs the big question here, who's this for? literally anybody. Okay, so show of virtual hands here. How many times has a friend of yours taken a picture of, I don't know, anything, a bug, a bird, a plant, and sent it to you and asked, what is this? I'm going to guess everybody here is raising their hands, or at least most of you. Um, and so that right there is 90% of it. You, 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 you already have iNaturalist users there you know, they're already taking a picture, they're already observing the world around them. And as Cassie said, it can be anywhere. It could be your backyard, it could be your local park or preserve, it could literally be a crack in the sidewalk uh, where you're observing life. But as long as you're out there paying attention, snapping a picture, recording audio, or just noticing, uh, that's half the battle of getting there. 
And that's really kind of the core to um, this whole thing. Again, it's trying to sort of really lower the bar as much as possible to make nature accessible and make it so that we can build this community around our observations. So yeah, easy enough. Take a picture, uh, take an audio, whatever suffices as an observation and get it up on iNaturalist, uh, whether you're using the app or the website or your, <laughs> You could even be several days after the fact you observed it, but you can still get that up there as a valid observation and add to this growing community and body of observations. Uh, the challenge this year, so our zone, the you know every every sort of city obviously is different. We have different geographies, different uh, you know sprawls, different sizes. So they we try to sort of equalize it as much as we can across cities. Um, so in the case of our Chicago region effort, we are focusing here uh, with Chicago Wilderness, obviously being our kind of sponsor to this. Uh, not all of the currently defined uh, Chicago Wilderness counties, but a good portion of it, and certainly all of these core collar counties around Cook and Chicago immediately. Um, quick also note that um, there are two other, um, oh my gosh, uh, projects happening locally in our area as well. So if you're in the Rockford area or the Rock River Valley, uh, they also have a group going into 2021 as well. Also St. Charles, the St. Charles uh, Park District run out of uh, Hickory Knolls, I believe, is also doing a, um, their own uh, City Nature Challenge bio blitz. So yeah, we have a couple of neighbors that are getting into this. And I suspect, honestly, as this competition continues to grow, uh, like we've been talking about here, we're probably going to see a lot more even localized efforts nearby. At first, it was just Chicago wilderness, but now we're seeing uh, partners like this more locally, and I suspect it'll probably continue to increase. So I just made a whole thing about talking about how egalitarian this is. Anybody can do it. Heck, you could be out there doing iNaturalist observations during the City Nature Challenge period and not actually be participating, but you're still technically participating, right? So anybody that's using iNaturalist in this time zone is technically part of the competition. You don't need anybody else or anything to go out and do it and be part of this whole thing. So why bother actually organizing around this? Well, there's a couple of ways where we can really all benefit from taking this sort of heightened interest and this magnification of interest and a desire to participate and really do a lot of really cool things with it. The first being just collecting urban diversity data. Uh, you know, while that happens all throughout the year from users of iNaturalist, this is a really great opportunity to uh, get people out there and really focusing on different places and organisms uh, that, you know, are of interest to both, you know, land managers, scientists, and all the folks that Cassie already told you guys about. Learning about our local flora and fauna. Again, whether you're an individual that cares specifically about a park because you're a steward or a manager, this gives you an opportunity again to really kind of get a nice good hyper focus on what's out there. What are we seeing? And additionally, if you're just a learner and you're out there looking for uh, opportunities to learn about what is that tree that's growing on my street or what are these birds flying through during migration. It's a great opportunity for you to learn because there's so much uh, interest happening in that moment. There's a lot more people and uh, you know, interested knowledge floating around in this time period. It also just connects us with each other. You know, I mean, obviously Chicago Wilderness, that's kind of what we're all about here, uh, trying to connect all of these peer and partner organizations and individuals working on comparable work. This is just another great example of a way that we can get to know each other and work with each other and continue to expand our community for uh, you know, naturalists in the region. I'm pretty sure the first time that I really met and learned, worked with Cassie was back in 2018 when we started doing uh, the City Nature Challenge that year. Uh, and <laughs> look at us now, we're still doing the City Nature Challenge together. Um, Additionally, supporting efforts, areas of interest. So this is a great opportunity for us to also drive uh, people who are INAT users or curious or when I get outside to places where we want them to go. Do you have a sort of park or area that maybe doesn't get as much attention as it really should or isn't as frequented? This is a great opportunity to really put that on the map and the radar and get people out there and excited about the assets that you have at your natural space. And then certainly uh, collaborating on identifying what's found. Uh, you'll notice one of the graphs that Cassie showed there is that sort of widening divide between the amount of observations that are being made and the amount of identifications that are being made, um, which is somewhat problematic. We want to make sure that all of those observations are ID'd to, for a, a whole host of different reasons. But by organizing around not only the uh, going out and observing, but then also identifying what we're finding uh, that certainly helps in the competition, uh, in terms of what actual species count we've had, but that also helps the process along of making sure that, you know, people don't go an entire year without their, uh, you know, their plant being ID'd and they just sit twiddling their thumbs. 
Uh, so under normal circumstances, we would have, you know, a, a pizza party where we'd all get together and sit in our laptops and identify stuff. That obviously be different this year, but again, it's a really important feature of the challenge. And then finally, it's for all of those cool peeps that you see on the screen there. I mean, these are all examples of people that I know have worked with and have been on hikes with that are out there looking at nature and looking at the natural world in different aspects. And now, okay, yeah, it is admittedly a little bit birder biased, but whatever, the point being, uh, you know, this is an opportunity for us to continue to sort of take this heightened interest in the outdoors, natural world. It's happening kind of early spring when everybody's itching to get outside anyway and go outside and go to their parks. Um, and so this is a great opportunity for us to, again, really ride this wave and engage with potentially new audiences, individuals who are, you know, new and inexperienced, but looking to learn more, you name it. So this already just gives us a great opportunity for connecting with the audiences we already want to connect with and get even more deeply engaged with them. Um, Cassie, this was your slide, if you want to jump in and talk briefly about what we're looking at here. Uh, so I just was looking for different, there's already research that's being published based on City Nature Challenge data or based on that exactly like increased amount of data, particularly in the spring. Uh, so this was a research in Boston where they were looking at kind of the prevalence of different species on a gradient of nighttime light level. So like people leave buildings and offices leaving night uh, lights on and just kind of street lights. So as a proxy for urbanness. So you can see that some species where like it gets more urban or more light as you go to the right. So this Canada Mayflower is not very not very commonly observed in urban areas, whereas the bumblebees and the milkweeds are actually relatively uh, densely observed. Garter snakes, not as much. Squirrels, that makes sense. There's a lot of squirrels in cities. So uh, just uh, an example of some of the research that's been happening with, with CNC or City Nature Challenge data. All right. So there's a lot of different ways that you can participate. Um, certainly, just as an individual, you just go out and start observing things. But if you're looking at it from an organizational standpoint or a, you know, a leader, a volunteer leader of some kind, um, and want to engage people more deeply in this project, there's a lot of ways you can do that. Certainly, the most common way is just lead a hike. Uh, most years, that's what it comes down to, is you've got a place that you really want to go to. You basically schedule an event for people to come join you at that site, and you go on a plant hike or a bird hike or an insect hike or whatever kind of experience, or just an all of the above hike, where you just go out and you just start observing things. That's the easiest way, but there's a lot of other alternative ways. So one way that I know I've worked with and I've seen other people do is sort of having a, a hub where basically you set up a table or a tent and you just have some resources so that people who are going by or passing through or show interest can get involved right there on the spot. They don't have to be guided, but they have the resources available. Um, one example I know is really great is the, um, they're the Field Museum Rapid Color Guides, which are, you can just print them right out. And if you have a laminator, you laminate those. And so then you can just have a couple of stacks of these. You hand them out to people as they show up and be like, oh, hey, you know what? These are the common uh, oaks in our area. Go see if you can find them. Um, and then the results is they can go out, have some fun, bring it back to your table. And because they're laminated, you can just spray them down, disinfect them, uh, or give out uh, dry erase markers so they can circle it. And then you have that as a resource that you can use again to pass out to different participants as they come and go throughout the day. So especially, for example, you work at a specific center, like a nature center, this is a great way to participate and involve people who are coming through who maybe aren't coming there for the challenge, but it's a great way to give them a sort of experience to sort of surprise, hey, you're here, by the way, this is a cool thing going on. Um, one way that I think it'll be especially useful this year as we try to maybe avoid encountering people a lot is setting some sort of goals or targets. So again, we were talking a little bit about, you know, maybe you have a park that's really underutilized and you really want people to go to and experience, right? Uh, setting that as a, man, you know what, we're pooling all in. We need all of our supporters to go check out this park because it's part of the mission. Uh, or you know what, maybe you just, you really want a lot of milkweed. That's okay. If we get 4,000 milkweed observations in the Chisney Nature Challenge this year, I'd be thrilled. So, you know, set out uh, Friday. Our target is milkweed. Everybody go find a milkweed, right? And that's easy. If all you get is everybody participating who observes one milkweed and then they call it a day, that's still engaging with people in their natural spaces that maybe wouldn't have before. Um, engaging virtually from home. I imagine that there are a lot of individuals who maybe will be following along on Facebook or iNaturalist in general who have questions. 
So the more that you can highlight the observations that people are making, whether that's at home in their yard or uh, engaging with conversations on social media, encouraging people to share their observations with you on your social platforms or your email you know, lists, et cetera, is another great way to engage with people without having to actually physically interact, but still getting everybody excited about the possibility of looking for life in and around their homes or wherever they happen to be. And then there's just sharing the event. Maybe you're not up to organizing an event yourself, or maybe you're not able to really invest a lot of time personally in the that weekend because you're at a conference or you're busy. We've all got lives. Uh, but being able to, again, just sort of spread the word via your word of mouth, social networks, emails, you name it, and just generally supporting what we're trying to do and to help us get the word out there is really important. Um, certainly not an exhaustive list, but those are just the ideas that came to my mind of all the different ways that you can participate. I'm sure there's plenty of other great ideas out there. So next steps. First things first, you, you have, have Cassie and myself here, uh, also Taryn and uh, Kristen who are here uh, in the background putting in the question, uh, asking your questions in the chat, uh, who are all kind of helping to co-organize the efforts this year, but that is not a uh, closed group. So if you're interested in helping support this event in some way, whether that's organizing events or you know, organizing the event as a whole and helping reach out to individuals and communities, please shoot us an email, let us know. We would love to add more folks to this group to help us really knock this one out of the park this year. Not that we don't every year, but you know, this year's this year. So we wanna knock it out this year, especially. Um, so we meet every uh, third Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Um, again, if you're interested in joining the group, but maybe that meeting time doesn't work still, please shoot us an email. We would love to hear from you guys. Um, submitting your actual trips and events. You don't have to be a co-organizer, but if you have something that you really want to do, you're like, oh man, you know what? I got a hike that I really want to do at this cool site. I want to get it onto the calendar. We are collecting a uh, list of events that will be posted on the Chicago Wilderness website and some of our other platforms like Facebook. Uh, where we will have all that available for the public to see what's going on. So they have some choices and options to explore over the course of this long weekend. Um, additionally, you know, say you already have a program that you already planned for that weekend. You weren't thinking of it as a city nature challenge thing, but hey, you know what? Let us know anyway, and we can then help, you know, direct via V of an event you already have, make your life easier and get people out there. Uh, and then finally, the actual blitz itself. So like I said, it's basically a long weekend. Um, where we go out there from whatever hour we can, from as much as we can, and to collect as many observations as we can and just have a blast while we're doing it. Have fun, go out there, go crazy. Then immediately after the Blitz itself, there's the identification week. So that's what we were talking about where we would normally have a pizza party. Um, we don't know what that's gonna look like this year, but the key here being that, you know, that roughly week long period, we're gonna be trying to identify as many of the things that people observe and try to get that data up to that sort of scientifically, what is it, uh, research grade, um, uh, so that we can actually make these observations, validate these observations, and then also boost up the actual diversity, confirmed diversity that we're observing over this weekend. And then immediately after that, the results are announced. Now I know it's not a competition, but obviously, you know, we want to, you know, really put ourselves out there. I've always been really bummed. I don't know why this one gets in my, you know bugs me, but St. Louis always just ekes ahead of us. What is with that? Comparable size city, comparable geography, and we always, they always beat us. Maybe this is the year we do it. Not a competition, but maybe this is the year we do it. Um, all right, cool. So I think that's all I've got here. Yeah. Sorry about that. Let's see, poll number two is coming your way. So we are curious uh, if you do um, work for an organization that might be interested in hosting events, just how many there are among you. And also we uh, posted our contact information and the link to, to submit your events too, or if you wanna join that planning meeting, um, just please do reach out to us so we know. And then, you know, if it's not applicable, you can just say not applicable. And then how likely is it that you would, we are curious, how likely is it that you would attend an in-person event? Remember, this is the end of April. Uh, they are almost always outside. So you've got that for you as far as distancing safely. And I'm going to say we only have around 50% people, 60%. Gonna close the poll in three, two, one. All right, so we do have quite a few people um, with organizations that think are thinking about doing events, which is awesome, somewhat likely, very likely. 
Um, and it does look like many people are likely to attend an in-person event, uh, socially and safely distant. So that's awesome to see and will help us with our planning as well. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think, thank you. That's really helpful feedback, uh, even if it's just a simple Zoom poll here, because that helps us really figure out what should we be prioritizing. Um, we want everybody obviously to feel safe and comfortable while we do this. Um, and whether that's a hybrid or a mix of things, we want to make sure that we're doing stuff that allows for everybody to participate, whatever their comfort level is. That's all, all we've got for you. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat, or if there were questions earlier, if Tara and, um, or Kristen could help out if any came up. Um, we've got our contact info here. We'll reach out with a link to this presentation as well as the slides and all the links that we shared. Lots of information coming at you fast, so we understand. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and seeing quite a quite a big spread here of individuals and organizations from across the region. So thank you all so much for coming. It's really cool to see you all here. There was one question about uh, connecting with local libraries that are near parks or gardens, or really just any libraries because there's nature all around us, whether there's green space or not, uh, it'll find its way. So I, I did try to reach out to libraries in the past year, but uh, that is one of my, I don't have the, the skills to kind of like get connected with all sorts of different organizations. So if anybody has a connection to libraries, um, it'd be something easy enough as like leave uh, some sort of like put something to put on a bulletin board or share at the, the checkout area about the City Nature Challenge happening, like a little flyer. People are still, you know, picking up their books and I, I've tried in the past, but it would be great if anybody has any connections, if you wanna send me an email or join our planning group. Yeah, and having uh, worked with a number of libraries for other projects, conservation related projects, I mean, almost any institution you go to is just always happy to hear about something local that's happening, something that they can plug their patrons into. Um, and certainly this year, as a lot of them still remain uh, virtual or sort of limited hours at, or trying to engage with their audiences in a virtual context, um, again, I think any that you approach would be really interested in at very least having some basic information that they can share and then uh, most especially if there's an event specifically happening nearby that maybe you're trying to organize. Uh, every library I've ever worked with has always been extremely happy to hear uh, when we have things like that for them. And that's a good point. I, I am doing a talk for the Skokie Public Library at, right, right before the City Nature Challenge that'll go a little bit more deep into iNaturalist. A lot of the content that I presented today, but just gives me a little more time to flush things out. Uh, so virtual events are uh, definitely an option now that most libraries have swapped over to doing many more of those types of events. Um, if you have people identifying things that are not uploading, how will we do that? I'm not quite sure I understand it, but you, yeah, you do have to upload it to iNaturalist in order for it to count for the challenge. It will automatically be counted for the challenge if it's added within the time period and within the, the Chicago metro boundary. Um, so yeah, it won't count if people aren't uploading it. Um, let's see, list of organizations planning CNC events. I would say um, well, what, what you see on the screen here, those are all the ones I know about. If you want to shoot me an email and I can, using those planning meetings as a way to try to connect people is definitely one of our goals. Um, and we also have a Google group. That's our main way of uh, communicating across this planning group. So if you if you send out, uh, if Kristen could link that uh, Google form just to send me your email address basically and um, we can try to link everybody to each other. Uh, we do have graphics that are available in our, we have a Google Drive of resources that we can share uh, if you wanna shoot me or anybody here an email. Observations in the Chicago area, let me go back to that map. So it's a very large area. It's all these counties uh, that will count for the City Nature Challenge. And so you definitely don't have to be within the city limits. You can be anywhere in Cook County, DuPage, you know, Kane, it's all, all these are counted. So it's really the Chicago, it's kind of a modified Chicago metro or metropolitan region that is included for the boundaries. And that's, that's reflective of most of the, most of the people participating, most of the other cities that are participating. So if you're on the, the call today and you're not, you're like, I don't live in Chicago, uh, just check out citynaturechallenge.org. They're gonna be uploading the list of cities very soon. So you can see how to get involved in your local area. 
So the window did close for new areas to participate uh, in 2021. So for Kane County, I would say, yeah, just kind of join on for us with this year and use this project and we can collaborate on getting your events posted to the Chicago Wilderness website. And uh, if you wanna, if you were interested in doing, if you wanna have your own project next year, you, there's a um, Google form at the bottom of the City Nature Challenge website that says, you know, sign up for 2022. And it will, that will let you get the information from the international organizers. And then just to, I don't know if we said it out loud, I wanna drive it home. This is just our regional planning initiative, but the City Nature Challenge globally is organized by the California Academy of Science in conjunction with the um, Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. So there's people like us having these types of presentations and organizing all throughout the world. And we're just one little piece of it and all coming together for this big challenge. So there is a verification process for the, the species being uploaded. Um, sometimes, you know, everybody makes mistakes. So you, you may call it a vertebrata pinata and somebody says, well, actually it's a vertebrata such and such. <laughs> and that's totally fine. It'll, uh, you know, they, hopefully they will be able to tell you why it's wrong or, you know, at least gives you an opportunity to go look and see like, oh, like I knew it was the right genus, but um, you know, it looks like it's a different species. You can always feel free to ask like, oh, how did you come to that identification? And people are very uh, helpful in, in letting you know or uh, giving you resources to uh, figure it out. Awesome. Um, well, thanks everyone. Uh, this was really great. Please definitely feel free to reach out with any additional questions and uh, or if your organization is interested in and helping out. We've got links to uh, all of the stuff here on the Chicago Wilderness website, and we'll follow up with the resources for the people who signed up for the presentation too. Can't wait to blitz with you guys. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>